Yeah. You can try one of these things. I'm gonna go right put that steelhead track on and be done with it. <coughs> Have you tried any of these yet or no? I just won. Which one? That kind of that uh, black and olive thing and the two. Oh. We were out last week trying to get some really interesting winter two-handed rod swinging space stuff on camera. We got bit with cold weather, low water, or I should say cold weather, water temperatures, um, low water flows, real stagnant fish. Uh, we didn't do too well. Our young team member Matt was the hero of the group. He managed to get a fish on one of the days. Just a lot of fuss casting to the other side of the river. Not interesting. So I thought I'd try something a little bit different. You know, tell me in the comments what you think on this whole attempt. It's going to be different. I'm going to try what some people call a blogger type attempt. I'm not quite sure what this blogger thing is. It could be me just babbling incoherently for how long mindlessly. Maybe that's what blogging is, I don't know. But anyways, I'm going to go over a lot of the equipment that we use, a lot of the setups we use, talk a little bit on the riggings, give you a close-up look, tell you about, you know, put my two cents into the whole space setup. There's just so much junk out there on the two-handed rods, spay rods. There's so many digital experts out there with their whole idea. Um, some of their stuff, I don't know. I really don't think these guys fish much, but I'm going to throw my two cents into this horrible mosh pit of whatevers and just show you what we do and, and how we do it and why we do it a little bit closer up. Maybe it'll make some sense to some of you. Maybe it won't. Uh, hopefully it'll help out and to this whole mess, I hope you find it entertaining. My plan is, is to go from here in the shop on the table to more detailed stuff to a little bit out on the river that we shot and use some of the video so it'll be a little bit more interesting than normal and it'll be worth watching on a YouTube thing but we're gonna try this format and see how it goes I hope you can follow along I hope I can make some sense here we go Oh, that felt great. <laughs> oh, you gotta find a better way for you to hook up your knives. I put on a little minnow pattern. Oh. That felt so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Notice you wore that mask. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, just motivate it? Yep, I did. <laughs> Always. So you said, yeah, oh, it is. Once you get close to the net, the rule is engagement. You gotta run away. Oh, you might want to play him more. Yeah. Oh yeah. Hang on her tight on the tail because yeah. Just up just a little. Just kinda let her go when she's ready. Okay. I mean she's good. Yeah. Let her go on her own. Works well. <laughs> yeah, works well. <laughs> You saying that's one of your what winter patterns? Good winter fly. Nice and petite. Yep. Not subtle. tied too much. Subtle tie. Okay, just keep rotating.
typical tube ply. We're going to use this as my um, discussion thing. Try to get close up in here so you can see what's going on. Often I'll keep the tube flies in my box or bag with a hook in them. Convenience. I do carry a little can of um, spare hooks of different sizes right in there. And the hooks I'm using right now are these Daiichi uh, 2557s. Uh, this is a size 4. I use 4s and I use 6s. A uh, quick little disclaimer. Um, Daiichi doesn't pay me any sponsorship or anything else like this. Any of the equipment that I'm me mentioning is because I like it. Not because I'm being sponsored. I'm sponsored by nobody. I guess I'm just... Nobody likes me. Oh well. What I'll do is for this demonstration right here. Um, I got a gob of 12 pound just because it's big and easy and you can see it. I'll just string on the tube fly right on. Kind of get it through the... Sometimes you get there a little bit. There we go. Get it right through. In the back of these flies, junction tube, just a soft, um, soft rubbery tube. That's to hold the hook in place. So, so at this point, come back, collect my hook, tie things in with your favorite hook knot. Everybody asks me which knot that I use. Uh, I got some sort of goofy Duncan knot that I've used for years. Uh, I tell everybody, you know, eh, come on. When you're always in front of a camera, you're always on the clock, you're in a hurry, you find that you come up with about 10 new thumbs. I'm just going to say, use it the best fly to tie, not to tie your fly in, it's the one you tie the best. There we go. So it's just tied on, come back, and this is real simple. You just slide that eye. See if we can show it to you on camera. That eye, that hook goes right back in that junction tube, and it holds it straight, nice and even. And then I can coordinate the hook the way I want to the top of the fly, the wing, and get everything so it tracks right. The main reason I like tubes over the shank flies is this hook is held nice and secure in the fly. It's not getting bumped around or knocked when the fish comes up behind it. That hook is right there. The shank flies, we've been getting some real funny hookups. But with these uh, tube flies, we've been getting really nice, solid in the corner of the jaw. We're not dropping the fish. We're not losing, not getting those weird in the chin hooks or the side of the cheek hooks. These fish are hooked right where they're supposed to be, right in the jaw. The fly comes out of the way, and we have a lot better fly survival rate once we're playing the fish. Plus, these tubes are surprisingly durable. This is our standard, this how we rig up a tube fly. A little bit closer look at what you see us doing in the field. All right, presentation discussion. This is obviously in the upper part of the river here. So we get a lot of narrow compressed areas in this particular spot. You can note the fast water on the far side and then we're working over some some skinny water or slower water excuse me and it's all pretty deep. And if you notice the fly line how we're getting an upstream drift corresponding with the downstream drift where the fly is. So we got a lot of converging currents in here and this can be a really challenging spot to swing a fly. So often what we have to do is get the fly out there, overload it for the swing, do a downstream mend, and let the fly crash to the bottom. Right about now, everything should be straightening out and the swing should be starting. I'm just going to keep moving the rod tip up and try to get some sort of an excuse of a swing coming out through that heavy water into the current seam where I'm hoping to fish a set. The other thing is with these spots is that very often you can get little micro positive current swings. Like, there we go. This one's going to work a little bit better. Right? The menu that can work. We're going to get the fly coming across at a little bit better rate. And you, just, you just have to keep working around, raking the water, as in keep dropping the fly in different spots and seeing how it swims through. These little corners here get very often get overlooked or they don't get fished well. And they can produce very often a, a pretty good grab by a non-molested fish. 
but you have to play around with these spots. This is one of these little locations where a traditional sink tip really doesn't help us. Like I said earlier, we're going to be using all sorts of different techniques, and in here I've gone back to the old school long leader, a little bit of shot, not a lot of shot, just a little bit, get the fly down so it can swim naturally along the bottom. I'm still not making heavy contact or any contact on the bottom. I just want to be close and I want a nice slow swing. But with the fluorocarbon leader and the shot, it does help get everything down very fast and set the swing up. So we are fishing a tight spot with a very short swing, so we need to get all the fishing time at depth that we can. Remember, we are dealing with winter conditions. We are dealing with 33 degree water. So we have to get that fly down as fast as we can, slow it down, and get it hanging and around the fish as long as possible. All right, well, here I go. I'm going to add to the digital mosh pit of one-handed, or excuse me, two-handed space stuff. Uh, so this is what works for good for us. We're not the prettiest casters. Our rods are not set up to cast pretty. Our rods are set up to be effective for us in our conditions. So going forward, understand this is what's worked for us over time and it's set up to be an effective fishing tool not an effective casting tool. Um, one other note uh, I'm going to be trying to show a lot of this stuff that we're doing kind of close up to the camera zoomed in so it's going to be a lot of me being a hand model uh, which is just as well because I sh got a face meant for radio it comes with a voice meant for silent movies but anyways I want to give everybody a fairly good close-up look to it, so it's going to be a lot of me trying to keep everything in the camera shot because I'm kind of working by myself, and you can just see these things a lot. But the whole point is I want you to get a good look at just what we're doing, and as always, I'm going to try not to be too boring. Well, I hope you can follow along, and I hope you find it interesting. Okay, we kind of got this whole thing kind of laid out in a mess right here. Um, basically what I didn't want to do is because this reel is nice and loud as a friend of mine would say loud reels save lives but I wanted to show you how I set this particular rod up this is my switch rod that I've been using a lot lately it's a 11 foot 4 inch uh, 7 weight and I got a, obviously I have a click drag reel on kind of like click drags they're fun they're loud and it's it's set for winter fishing and you'll see right here this is some running line. It's 40 pound. Um, I think this is from OPS. Once again, I'm not sponsored by any of these people. So you'll see a whole wide mix of equipment. It's just the equipment we have here is what survived the time and works best for us. But it's a running line. And the reason for the running line in the winter is you can see it's a little coily. But it, you have that problem with just about every line. It, you'll have that coil in cold weather. A little bit of tension, a little bit of casting, it'll straighten itself out. The big thing is being thin like this, it loses the water. The water falls off of it when it's, so we don't pull a lot of wet line in the guides. If you don't put a lot of wet line through the guides, you don't have such an icing problem. So we run that, plus if it is really cold, it'll freeze on there and it'll kind of fall off of it as it comes in. The downside of it is, is sometimes it'll slip through the frame of the reel. It'll kind of pop out through here. Get my hand out of the way. Pop out through here and you'll have to play with it. This reel hasn't been a problem. Some of my beloved Nautiluses will have a problem with that. But a little bit of practice, you'll get over it. It's also really thin. So this is pretty slick stuff, as you can see. It's sometimes like handling a grease pig. I know a few people have actually put some friction tape on the grips here to um, solve that problem. And then all I do is on the front is I got a perfection loop. To the fly line and you can not only get should see it on the camera here about where my fingers are to here that's the size of it and then just loop it on and this is a uh 20 foot skagit um driver head it's looped on nice thing about the amount of running line when this thing gets beat up a little bit i actually can feel some roughness right here probably should do it go back and you can cut five ten feet off and you're right back in the clean running line there's a hundred feet of this stuff you can sacrifice a bunch of that and not be a problem. And then, you know, when it gets short, put it in your leader kit. Use it for indicator butts on your leader so you can recycle it that way. 
Anyways, 20 foot driver head, Skagit driver head. Skagits are always designed to run with um, uh, some sort of tip. And in this case, this is my dry setup. And I got a, a floating, a 10 foot floating. Um, I'm using the real Mo tips in the 10 foot. They work really good. And I set my basically from about a, my seven, eight, nine weights rods all up. When Skagit systems all up to to cast really comfortably, really well with a medium. That way, if I go to a light um, tip or a heavy tip, it's an easy adjustment on our end to make it work. Obviously, this 10 foot, and then it's my dry line. I go to a standard, uh, one of my standard leaders, and I got a 10, 12 foot leader. When I'm fishing tight spots, like I was demonstrating on the or talking about on the uh, video earlier. Yeah, we can use split shot. It's not the cool way to swing flies or the in way, but it's a quick way to get a fly down in a very converging currents, very deep, narrow spot, and make a swing, make a presentation to the fish. Yeah, it's split shot, but hey, we've been doing it for 60 years. God, is that fishery's been around that long? <clears throat> but we've been doing it forever. It's a good way to swing. It's an easy, it's sometimes taking a step back is a good way to solve a tough when you're fishing a tough spot. But this is basically a standard switch setup that especially for the winter with the Skagit so on. That way if I want to swing with a switch rod I still got a loop to loop set up. I can put on whatever 10 foot and I do use um, swing with 10 foot tips, sink tips. They seem to work in the water we're fishing in. So it's a really easy, um, very adjustable on the fly setup. This is the uh, switch rig. Well, we're day two on this whole spay thing. Today we're going to run the drift boat and float the upper part of the river and just see if we can't get away from a few people and, and see if we can find a fish that will grab for us. So today we're going to do a little bit of casting out of the drift boat, a little casting, waiting. So we're going to float, fish from the boat while we're floating a little bit. Do this all with our two-handed rods. We got switch rods with us and we got our spay rods. So we're going to see what we can find. <laughs> well, who's the heaviest? Probably right, Jay. Probably not me. <laughs> yeah, I'm turning it into a fat ass. Yeah, so I'll probably vape in front just to show you some balance. That means Matt's got a work camera. What? That's alright. Well, that or I can put you in the back, Jay. Doesn't matter. I'll go in the back. Problem. Mm -hmm. No, we'll just have to pick our way. All we can do. Yep. We should make 285. I'm almost wondering if I should go drop down a tip. I have to. Well, you are in that slower scene. Yeah. I'm coming out of that slower scene. And get it out into that faster water there. She's digging. You know, we were fishing some tighter water yesterday. Yeah. And we needed to have your tips. And now we're not in such tight water. Yeah, you might have to drop down to your T8 or something. Yeah, bud. I got T11 on. It's just getting really slow and it's dragging. And I want a clean swing. It might have been a little too heavy. Yeah, you're getting a little too slow of a swing now. Yeah, yeah, we're having tip issues. We just dropped in the top of a pool. Yesterday we were fishing another pool that was a little tighter, a little narrower, as you saw earlier. Now we're in a little wider pool, same amount of water coming through, but because it's wider, the water pressure is not as heavy. So these tips are dragging. Even though it's cold and we got to be low, we got to have our swing slow, it's still, you don't want your fly dragging across the bottom. It just doesn't look right to the fish. So the nice thing about these Skagit setups here, I just pulled off my T11 tip and in my pocket I got a handful of tips and leaders. Here's a T8 and I'll just swap this right out. Obviously I'm using these real Mo tips because they're convenient. And as you can tell I got a real mess of them, nesting stuff here and leaders going everywhere. And this makes it really handy to just um, shift tips. Set this mess down in here. This is a brand new one. 
check a T8. So I got to put a leader on it. So I'll probably, in this case, out of interest of time, and I want to get back to fishing, I'll probably just steal a leader off another tip. I generally just leave the leaders on my tips. That way, it just saves time on the water when you're doing a uh, a tip change. So I got real tight loops on these things, trying to get them to fit over these Skagit drivers can be a challenge sometimes. Well, we'll just kind of cheat here a little bit. There we go. Yeah, perfect. A nice little square knot look. And in this case, this nicely coiled leader, I'll just uncoil it and steal the leader off from this off from this tip. And just get back to fishing quicker. I'll just repack this leader into my pocket and it'll be ready to go for if I get into some another tighter spot in the river where I need to get the fly down a little faster. Mm -hmm. Nice thing about the Skagit systems within a few minutes we can have a custom setup for the water we're fishing. Huh? Your leader setup. Oh. Yeah, Ricky says say something about my leader setup. Alright, let me get it. I'm dealing with leader tangles here, folks. I always say, when you're in a hurry, guarantee your leader's going to get all tangled up on you. And here we go, tangled up. Off these tips, generally what you're going to see as fishing is short leaders. Short-ish, I should say, leaders. Generally somewhere between uh, four to six feet, depending. This water's kind of low, it's clear, we got some fishing pressure around. So I will be more towards the six foot today just to cover it and you can see I'm struggling with some knots for some reason the guy that made this leader at Rio made some really tight loops he must like tight loops but in this case I do have a complex tapered leader it's about six feet a lot of guys will just take 12 pound and then run four or five feet I like to taper my leader somewhere from like starting at 20 and going down to 12 to 10 your inventory that you cast in a, a tube fly a shank fly in this case, a small bead head fly that I'm going to be running will all turn over a lot easier on these more complex tapered leaders. As a result, that gives everything lays out a little cleaner in the water. You can set your you swing up faster. You can be a little bit more precise with your cast. You can cast it around the debris on the other side. If you got an overhanging tree on the other side of the river, you can get the fly in there a little cleaner. So that's I've always found it worth the time to tie these more um, complex leaders. Get this thing done up and we'll the dentist get, always yells at you for that. <laughs> I get the dentist was going. And we're just gonna run an old standard small bugger today. The water's low and clear. I would just want to run some small try some smaller flies before I get the really big fun stuff out. On the video you saw me kind of quickly going over um, tips, switching a tip. And I wanted to show you kind of the tips I use and a little bit about how I go about them. Um, you'll take note that I use a very sophisticated system for storing them. Uh, a Ziploc bag, jam full of tips. And then on my purse when I'm fishing, just a smaller Ziploc bag full of tips. I don't know what there is about Ziploc bags. No, they're not a sponsor. I use a lot of Ziploc bags. They're cheap. But basically, here again, I use a lot of mo tips. Basically, I like them because they're pretty well set up the way we want. I mean, you can see right here, they'll have a uh, designation of how long they are. In this case, this is T8, which gives me about 8 to 10 inches of sink time. I do store them with the leaders on. They have a loop, so it's really easy to loop them on the end of the driver's skagit heads that I'm using, or whatever my driver head is. This is a um, poly leader, which I'd use in lower water conditions. 
and just having this big bag pile collection of tips allows me to basically customize you know like here we go medium mo t11 so i you know carry t8 t11 some t14 in and in real extreme cases t17 will allow me to just custom set up for each spot that i'm fishing and i can switch a tip out in just a few minutes so when i get into a wider piece of water or a narrower faster piece of you know the water's compressed flowing faster or if i'm in a wider spot where the water's flowing a little slower i can very easily just change my tip up and get it custom for that setup what a lot of people will often do is to put one tip on well i like how it casts with this tip i don't care how it casts with that tip i care about how it fishes with that tip i want to get my fly to the fish so carrying a collection of these things and custom setting up for each pool and runs you go through is one of the big secrets to being consistently successful swinging flies. Just because you like how your rod casts with a certain tip doesn't mean you should always fish that tip in all water flows and all water depths and all water speeds and in all times of the year. It, you're not going to tell a fish what it's going to do what you want it to do it's fish is going to do what it's going to do and you got to adjust to the fish and this by being able to be really flexible with these tips is one of those things you know, take this one out this is a not by you can't tell by the package it's relatively new but it is and you can see the loops right on the ends here so i'll just loop on leader on one end and um loop the other end onto the driver head Generally, I fish somewhere between four to six foot liters, all tied with fluorocarbon. I'll go over a liter sometime in the, um, later on. But this is basically, yeah, I'll carry what I think I should bracket on the high side or the deeper water, the heavier the tip to what I think I need for the day, and the lightest tip when I need for the day. Then I'll carry a spare too in case something happens and I wrap one around a rock or something. But this is, you know, here's a floating tip that I'll carry. And uh, yeah, and then just have just a big nest collection pile that I'll carry in a gear bag or whatever. And I've always have spares because they just get banged up. But you can literally, if you're just fishing for yourself, not guiding like I am, you can have a carry of you know, probably three to six tips and you have practically 95% of the conditions that you're going to be into covered. Bony. Oh, yeah, it's bony. It is bony. You got some cell service here? <laughs> no, those people. Oh, yeah. That's that's the mud hole. That's the mud hole? Yeah. Most of the time with these two handed rods, we're casting from the shoreline. But in this situation here, as you can see, we're doing a lot out of the boat today. Casting out of a drift boat, it's different, but it's not all that complicated. You just kind of have to work with the guy that's behind you and time with your swing. And the other thing is, is you just got to pay a little bit more attention to your casting. Uh, I got Rick right here in the bow of the boat, and you'll watch that when he comes up to set up for his cast, he's just going to do a kind of a cat arm downstream cast right off the bow of the boat. So that way he's not going to run his D loop or his cast right into the right into the boat or up into himself. It's you can see it's a very easy cast. The other thing to keep in mind is he's using a 13 and a half foot rod and when you're standing in the bo drift boat you're 
more out of the water and that 13 foot rod almost comes like 15 or 18 feet just by the fact that you're not knee deep hip deep in the water you're actually your feet are about water level sitting in a drift boat so you want to keep your rod tip a little lower so that you can keep your D loop anchored into the water you don't blow your D loop it's obviously you can tell that there's a lot of power that you can get out of there and a lot of distance you can get just sitting in a drift boat of course it's winter steelhead fishing where the water's cold and it's nice not soaking your toes in the ice water to be able to be in the drift boat you probably also note that how both um, Matt and Rick kind of timed their swings there goes Matt he'll fire his off now oh, there goes Ricky And they'll be able to work their swings right through together. Kind of offering to still have a smorgasbord of whatever's for flies. For once again fishing out of the drift boat for obvious reasons on a cold winter day in ice water. You got Matt in the stern of the boat, and and in this side of the river he's going to use a circle sea cast. That'll put a D loop just upstream out of the way of the. <coughs> Of the boat that way he ain't pulling his anchor into the drift boat and even though the anchor lines out there with the circle C you just have to make sure that you just set the cast a little bit more upstream or maybe out in front of you so it doesn't end up in the anchor line but really nothing different for the guy in the back in this situation as always you're just kind of timing that guy will go first on the swim on the cast get set up then the bow guy will be shortly right after. Swinging out of the back of the drift boat. And casting out with a two-handed rod out of a G-strip boat. So really not that complicated. And very comfortable. All right, here's one of our full-size spay rods, or big boy spays. Uh, this is a 13 foot seven weight. Uh, as time goes on, I've been more of a fan of the seven and eight weights for steelhead fishing. Little lighter physically, a little bit more sporty with the fish. But this is definitely my full-on two-handed rod setup here. Once again, you'll notice because of the ice conditions, just like the switch rod, I'm running the um, some, ah, geez, I don't know, I think this might be airflow. Like, it, like I said, nobody sponsors me, so I use whatever I have for equipment and whatever works. This is a Nautilus reel. Once in a while, this line will slip through the frame here. Uh, that is a problem, but I don't blame the reel because if you made the reel tight enough so I wouldn't have a problem with this running line slipping through, it would be so tight that it would be grinding, gritting it all the time. But with a little bit of practice and paying attention, it becomes not a problem. I've gotten used to handling it, so I don't have any grip tape on here. This is a Skagit driver head. You'll notice it's a little different color. Uh, it's a 20 foot um, intermediate sink. During the winter I like to, or I often preach, slowing that fly down. And with the intermediate sink I can slow my swing down. Plus it's a little easier to get the fly deeper and keep the fly deeper with an intermediate sink. So very often I'll run these intermediate sinks even in the spring when the water temperatures are up, if I'm in really high water, really big runs, or I have a lot of really confused converging currents, because when you drop this driver head down about a foot below the surface, very often your fly lines are not, or your fly, your, uh, if you get your tips getting pulled around funny, your driver head's getting pulled around funny, your tip's going to get pulled around funny, and your fly's going to get pulled around funny. And sometimes that fly being pulled through the water is not going to look good you don't want the fly going through the water like this you want the fly to go through the water like that a little presentation tip there so if you got a lot of conversion currents sometimes a solution to that is run an intermediate sink it'll get below it so I'm often switching back and forth to this depending on where I'm fishing and what I'm fishing but it's a nice it's a sink it's not terribly fast it just gets it down it slows the swing down it gets you into more consistent water columns when you've got some some confused currents then let's see here get right there there obviously it's looped in the normal way to the running line here you can see I got a basically loop to loop this is a Rio 10 foot T8 tip that's on it right at the moment it's just looped once again 
quick easy adjustment when I'm working through the different runs I can just switch out within just a few minutes like I've talked about with the tips and the other thing is is I generally run a fairly short in this case I got about a six foot leader on it is a complex leader I do time a little bit of a taper everybody says it's a waste of time I like how they turn over yes I just said we're not too concerned about how pretty a cast are but it turns it over a little neater so if I'm casting towards trees under trees I can get a tight loop and not throw the fly into trouble and of course hey look one of our tube flies I think I stole this one out of Ricky's box so this is basically a standard setup that we'll use during the winter I like to use now really quick the only difference I would do is try to keep this on the camera here. Here's a reel right here, big old Nautilus. Uh, during the summer, oops, hopefully I can get this off without making a big tangled mess. No, it's a tangled mess. Looks like I'm going to have to turn the camera off. Uh, here we go. We're getting it. You ever notice how these things always tangle when you're in a hurry? As you can see, this, this um, tip's been on for a while. Anyways, there's one of the problems with the Nautiluses, but it's I think it also keeps the uh, grit down. Anyways, I'll take a minute. Oh, here we go. One of the quickest ways to deal with this is just pop the just pop the uh, spool little tip here. If you yeah, this is going to be a real problem. Okay, real quick pro tip: if you're ever falling off a cliff and you need to save your life. Take the fly line and throw it at the cliff. It'll snag on the edge and save your life. Fly lines always tangle. Back to shutting the camera off and trying to untangle this mess. See what I mean? They always tangle. Okay, I'm back after about 10 minutes of trying to unsort this. This is basically going to be a warmer weather above freezing setup for me. This is a uh, real connect core um, running line. I really like these things. They're easy to handle. They're not like chasing grease pigs. They don't get hung up around the spool frames as much as the mono does. And they shoot just as good. The mono you get more distance than you do with these um, running lines. But how far do we have to cast? If we're casting 60 to 80 feet, we're probably already overcasting in most situations. It is a few spots we can boom a bigger cast, but most of the 90% of the time we're fishing under 80 feet. And so a running line is just really convenient. I don't mind killing a little distance because we don't need it. Uh, one of the problems with these things is you do want to watch your loops because they do wear up in here. So they wear pretty fast in the top end, so you want to be mindful of that. Uh, I've heard of people um, talk about swapping them. Uh, I don't. I just kind of get rid of them, make sure my hands stay in the thing. Once again, 20 foot um, driver head. This is a floating into a, to my um, troublesome 10 foot of uh, T8 uh, tip, which was on this reel. So something like this, I'll be running, and this put it like this, I'll be running once the temperatures get above freezing. Right now, Ricky just runs these things because he just does. Now we got a nice mess here with all this fly line here. It'll probably take me the rest of the day to untangle it. So, I'm going to get to work. Thanks for watching, folks. This obviously went a little longer than normal. I hope you found it, hope you found it entertaining, informative. You know, we threw a lot into the digital mosh pit of Spay when you, with all the stuff that I showed. So, this is just an insight, a little bit of an insight in what we do, how we go about it. Uh, give us your comments. Tell us how you liked it. Tell, if, tell me if it was helpful. All this will be useful since we're still just getting started. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, hit the bell icon. Temperatures are getting better. We're going to be on the water a lot now going forward. Also, we have time available with the guide service. So if you'd like to get out with us, uh, just get in contact with me. We got time right now available, right now for the spring steelhead run going forward. So once again, thanks for watching. Please comment. Please hit the subscribe button. Thanks, folks. Hope you enjoyed.